interdisciplinary climate change research, research which joins the dots between the climate science, the emissions and the pathways of those emissions to avoid certain levels of climate change, and then to try to understand the kinds of policies that we might need to put in place to avoid certain levels of climate change through uh, minimising or limiting the growth in emissions. So what's my position on economic growth? Well, the thing is that I see this problem through a lens of physical sciences, um, not through a lens of the economist. And through the physical sciences, I try to tackle these issues of climate change. What I can see is that climate change is detrimentally damaging our planet. We need to avoid as much further warming as possible. I mean, that's just a very basic sort of physical sciences approach to kind of the problem. And we don't need to do any more modelling work to actually work that out. You know, we've come to some consensus that we are damaging our planet and we need to avoid further warming. We also know that the cause of the rapid is the rapid growth in emissions, and particularly since the 1950s and particularly from fossil fuel use. But that's about how I see the problem, that's not how I see the solution necessarily. So the solution I see through both the physical and social sciences, sciences because I'm not kind of um, sort of naive enough to think that engineers and physical scientists will come up with the solutions in order to tackle this problem of climate change. I do accept that there are institutions, community groups, businesses, organisations, individuals, behaviours, practices and so on that all play a role in trying to, de to deal with this issue of growing emissions. But I also still see that emissions need to reduce urgently and rapidly and it's that that is our key problem, our fundamental problem which why the economics uh, comes in and plays such a strong role. Now we know that there's a lot of uncertainties about the impacts, both physical and social, in terms of climate change. But we also know that the more the emissions rise, those, the worse those impacts will be. So it's quite a straight, straightforward relationship really. We want to minimise those emissions, the, the rise in those emissions, in order that we minimise the impacts. So what do we aim for? Well, governments have signed up to avoiding a two degrees of warming. But as a physical scientist, I like to think, well, you know, is that a good, is that a good target to aim for? How do we know that that's, that's the right sort of level of temperature change that we need to avoid? Well, the science shows us that this is sort of linked to things like the destruction of the vast majority of coral reefs, uh, many more extreme weather events, droughts, wildfires, frequency of floods, all, in, all increasing in terms of, of the number and frequency that we're going to see. So to me, that seems like a reasonable thing to want to try to avoid. So I can do analysis around this two degrees of warming and what that might mean in terms of emissions. But that doesn't mean to say that I haven't looked at what the alternative might be. So what about the risks of a four degree of warming? Well, I'll just give you a quick snapshot. If we had a global average, of war average warming of four degrees instead of two degrees, then the hottest days that we were experiencing this year, say in cities like New York and Chicago, would be up to 10 to 12 degrees warmer under an average 4 degrees of warming. So devastating impacts going to affect many different aspects much, much more, um, uh, in, in much more damaging ways than the 2 degree target. So there's some basic maths and physics on it. If we know what we're aiming for, then we can actually join some of those dots between the climate target and the emissions. We take our temperature target, what we know is that the amount of emissions that we put into our atmosphere over a particular time, because those emissions accumulate, is actually re re related directly to the temperature that we'll end up with. So what we can have and what we can kind of quantify is a global cumulative emission budget associated with a particular temperature rise. It's a bit like having your salary, you know how much you've got to spend in your month, it's limited and that's what you've got and that's what we have in terms of emissions. We can also then break down the responsibility for that budget by looking at who's emitting the most, where those emissions could be most easily influenced, um, and other aspects such as perhaps the historical responsibility for producing those emissions. And when we divvy out that global carbon budget, we can also they said, then say something about the pathway that a particular country or sector or region might want to follow in order to do its part, play its part in, in avoiding uh, the cumulative budget getting any bigger and trying to meet that two degree temperature target. Now what's our starting point? Well unfortunately our starting point is exponential growth in CO2 emissions. So CO2 emissions at the left hand side, this little blip <coughs> here is due to the economic recession. So we know there's one way of reducing the emissions, that's to have an economic recession. So we've got our starting point, exponential growth, very challenging to overturn. Now I also want to show you a graph of if we have to divvy out the responsibility. So we've got our emissions of carbon dioxide at the left hand side, Time from 1990 out to 2100 along the bottom. And this is just for a 50 50 chance of avoiding two degrees. <coughs> now, I would actually like to see a much greater chance of avoiding two degrees, given what I know about the impacts. But this is just for a 50 50 chance. 
Now these are the emissions that we've already released behind this red line here. So there's nothing we can do about that. Those emissions are with us now and they're accumulating in the atmosphere. And again, this is the blip due to the economic recession. Now this pathway is the emission pathway that we need to follow to avoid two degrees on a global scale. Now what if we split this emission pathway into the richer countries and the poorer countries, so the Annex 1 countries and the non-Annex 1 countries? Well one of the things that we know is that the non-Annex 1 countries' emissions are growing very rapidly and that is to help development and improve well-being and health and so on. And it's also because it's linked to a fossil fuel economy. So there's not a lot we can do about that, certainly not in the short to medium term. But if we're very optimistic about how soon those emissions could perhaps peak, and reach a peak and start to reduce, given the fact that they are locked into this energy system that we cannot change overnight, then what we can do is we can say, well, what of our emission budget that, that has to kind of cover everyone in the world, what is going to be used by the non-Annex 1 countries, by the poorer countries of the world? And once we've worked that out, we can say, well, what's left for us? And this is where they come back to the, the economics. So the red line here is the, non, is the Annex 1 countries, so the rich countries, countries like the UK. And you can see that there isn't actually a great deal left for us, not if we want to avoid a 50-50 chance of 2 degrees. We have to have already peaked our emissions, and we have to reduce emissions by about 30% by 2020, at a rate of about 6% per year. And this is, like I say, quite a conservative analysis. So this poses a huge problem for us. If we want to avoid 2 degrees, the cumulative budget approach shows us that emissions in the Annex 1, the rich countries need to stop growing immediately, reduce at least 6% per year, probably more. But the problem is that everything we do has a carbon penalty. So the more we buy, the more we emit. The richer we are, the more we emit. The more rapidly the economy grows, the more rapidly the emissions grow. So as long as we have this fossil fuel economy that we're locked into, and it's going to take at least 20 years to change that significantly towards a low carbon energy supply, it means that we have to look at the things that we do and the ways in which we use energy in order to try to achieve these sorts of emission reductions. So the more advanced economies need to look at economic contraction in the meantime. What's the alternative? Well, the alternative is that we have to be more honest with those people who are trying to adapt to climate change and say that we're going to be facing a very high climate impact future.